following interview was conducted with Dave Bundy, Program Director of WVAA uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, February 12, 2009, Stewart Center 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. I was born on the north side of Chicago. Uh, June 18, 1943. I have a, an older sister who's about three and a half years older than I am. And uh, my father was Harold Bunty, my mother Virginia Hyatt. They married about uh, somewhere around 1936 or thereabouts. Uh -huh. uh, my mother was from Streeter, Illinois originally, my father from Kankakee, Illinois. And my mother's family had moved to Kankakee and that's, uh, that's where they met uh, shortly after high school. And uh, yeah, maybe maybe before they were out of high school. And uh, as my father said, she chased her, and uh, he he chased her until she caught him. I think is the way he always put it. And uh, my father got a double E degree from the University of Illinois. My mother did not continue school past high school, um, but was uh, uh, and to this day is good living proof that uh, uh, good common sense can take a person a long ways. My mother is uh, still living at 92 and a half almost, and uh, lives down in Florida with my sister and her husband. I moved to Wheaton, Illinois exactly two weeks before my fifth birthday. I have some, uh, some clear but very sketchy, very short memories of living in Chicago. I remember a little bit about the house, I remember walking to the little grocery store with my mother and, and just a little bit more than that. But I really remember a lot more after we moved to Wheaton. Uh, we moved into a very large house that was uh, one of the largest in the neighborhood with a big yard, so there were you know, lots of kids over all the time. Uh, some people may recognize the name Wheaton, Illinois as uh, uh, the home of Wheaton College where Billy Graham went to college. I walked through the Wheaton College campus every day on my way to school, into to elementary school, and, uh, and I uh, so that's where I got my uh, my elementary education. Was it a large school? Uh, it was a pro I, 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 by those standards. I don't know. I think it was about four hundred kids. Uh, the it's elementary nice level. Size. So it was a nice. Uh, I think it was three story building, a big old square brick building, and the uh, and Wheaton was about twenty five miles due east of downtown Chicago. So it was uh, it was a bedroom community. No industry in the town but uh, pretty much uh, nonstop suburbs from there all the way into Chicago where my father worked for uh, Commonwealth Edison Company in the power sales and distribution area. And, uh, and we lived there until uh, uh, after I was married. My folks lived there. Uh, I went to... Uh, Tell us uh, about high school. Did you go to high school? Then? I went to junior high and then also high school. At the time, it was uh, the only high school in Wheaton. There are now uh, two. It was a Wheaton Community High School, and uh, just as a little aside, over the years, uh, you sometimes bump into people who uh, become well-known later on. I went to uh, uh, elementary, junior high, and high school with Bob Woodward of Woodward and Bernstein uh, fame. Have not been in touch with him much, talked to him a handful of times uh, when I was in Washington, D.C. on business, but uh, uh, that was, uh, you know, when I look back on it, I thought that was kind of interesting. Because actually, when the uh, when the book and all that came out, it, the name Bob Woodward didn't click with me right away. Until so later it can on. be somewhat of a common name. You yeah, know? yeah, it's it's not that big a deal. Right. But then, you know, to this day, when I see him on television, I realize, my goodness, you know, I recognize him in a heartbeat because, although I guess he really has, it seems like he hasn't changed all that much. But uh, uh, after I graduated from Wheaton High School in 1961, I uh, applied to a couple of different schools. But I enrolled at Wheaton College right there in town, and uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I'd like to become an attorney someday, and, uh, but then I started realizing how much reading there was, and uh, I had an eye injury as an 11-year-old that made, slowed down my reading somewhat, and I thought maybe I wouldn't be able to handle that. So I decided I wanted to be a writer until uh, a few English teachers convinced me that I couldn't write. And I, but I got interested in, in uh, broadcasting as a profession. I had become quite interested in radio in general as a youngster. I can still remember at age five and six and seven, literally sitting on the floor 
in our living room in front of the console radio with my head leaning up against the speaker and turned down low listening to the shadow and gun smoke and some of the old radio dramas that and I, I usually had it tuned down low enough so my sister couldn't hear it because she was not welcome in my world of fantasy that's at one the of these big ones that you sit up yeah, and see the yeah. pictures for the fireside chats of FDR that that's the kind out. and uh, then as somewhere around age 9 or 10 I started becoming fascinated by the notion of wireless communication and I read a little bit about it at age 11 and uh, got to be more and more fascinated with the possibility of talking to people around the world and by age 15, I had gotten my amateur radio license and began talking to people on the radio around the country and around the world. And that has actually been my number one hobby for the past 50 years. I still do it to this day. And uh, so that was... It's a hobby that self-perpetuates. Once you get on it, people stick with it. You can, yeah. Yeah, yeah not everyone. But in yeah. fact, Bob Woodward had his amateur radio license when we were in, in uh, uh, high school, but he didn't stick with it. Some people do and some people don't. But... Uh, it, it's something that I enjoyed for a long time. Uh, I was I was an avid radio listener also. I listened to uh, talk radio of the 50s. And uh, that might be uh, uh, somebody, you know, doing a, a nightly talk show from, uh, from a restaurant or nightclub in Chicago uh, with various guests. And I was just fascinated by what I would hear on the radio. I, unlike... Most of my peers, I was not into pop music and rock and roll on the radio. Uh, I've stated a number of times, and it's the absolute truth, I heard people talk about Elvis Presley for about two years before I first heard him. And it just wasn't my thing. Uh, I, I grew to really enjoy some rock and roll music, but I just didn't get into it the way some people did. At the same time that I was listening to the radio in the living room, I also would, by choice, listen to some classical music records that we had in the home. And uh, I probably uh, fell in love with Chopin piano works then, and to this day, Chopin is one of my favorite composers, and, and piano is clearly my favorite instrument. I like lots of instruments, but piano is number one in my heart, even though I was never much of a piano player. I did take lessons a little bit and, and dabbled with a few other instruments, but I joke now that I... I can barely play footnotes with a shoehorn, and I can play a CD player pretty well. But the uh, uh, after high school, I, like I said, I went to Wheaton College, and because I'd gotten interested in radio, they had a little radio station. So I went down, and I got a, a job. I was an announcer on a little music program one or two evenings a week. And while I was there, I met a young lady that worked in their record library, and I was taken with her immediately. I, for some reason, assumed that she was probably an upperclassman. Something about her beauty and her poise convinced me that she probably was, and therefore, as a lowly freshman, I would barely be able to pass the time of day with her. And later that night, or maybe the next day, a fellow that had introduced us at the radio station realized that I was interested in her. He said, well, you ought to take her out. And I said, well, I said, you know, isn't she a junior or senior? Oh, no, she's a freshman, just like you. So I called her on the phone, and we proceeded to see each other every single day or evening, except one, for the next three weeks. She had gone home for the weekend, so I missed that one time. What was the record, tell us, for the research, what was the records? Was the record that what she was in charge of? The records uh, that she was just one person that helped to file records. The, the program that I hosted was uh, uh, an, an early evening uh, kind of dinner music. Uh, I think the theme was that we used was the way you look tonight. Just you know, pretty music, all instrumental, and uh, and so on. But we started dating, and our first, although we we did a lot of stuff together, our first official date was to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra that was performing in town, and and uh, so on. And it turned out she lived in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. So even during the summer, it was not too hard to get together and see her. I had a I had a part time job. But I could leave. I could leave work at six o'clock on a Saturday evening and drive down to her place, and we could go bowling or have pizza or go to a show, and and so on. Uh, I did not stay at Wheaton College very long. I was excuse having. Me, excuse me. Were you living at home? When I you was were there? living at home, and I I was not. 
I was not a highly motivated student. High school and school before that had really come quite easy to me, and I consequently didn't develop very good study skills. And Wheaton was an uh, academically challenging school with high expectations, and I struggled through and didn't do particularly well and didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so after one year, I dropped out. And I, uh, I did take a summer school class. I wanted to make up one poor grade that I'd gotten. I did that in summer school. And then I decided I was going to travel and work for a while. So I took off and scared the daylights out of my mother. I hitchhiked down to Florida and uh, was down there for a while and realized this was really stupid because that wasn't going to go anywhere in my life. So I came back and I uh, went back to school at a uh, school nearby in Elmhurst, Illinois. I uh, started out part-time, and then I, and then I moved into a dorm the second semester and went full-time. And in the meantime, I decided I wanted to major in broadcasting. And at the time, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale had arguably the finest broadcasting curricula in the country. And being a state school, it wasn't going to be too expensive. I uh, got my credits transferred down there, went to a dorm down there where I uh, proceeded to major in radio and television broadcasting really enjoyed it, started doing well in school for the first time in a couple of years, and uh, got my Bachelor of Science in Radio and TV in uh, 1967. And uh, six years after I got out of high school, a little time not in school, a little time taking some more hours, I ended up with lots and lots of hours of credit. In fact, I qualified for two different majors and two minors. At the time, you couldn't have a double major, so I had to pick one, and I picked one, and I had to pick one as a minor, and I did. But I, in fact, uh, got a minor in the general sciences. Excuse me. Uh, uh, yeah, a minor in the general sciences, a minor in uh, speech communication, uh, my major in radio and television, and, in fact, I qualified uh, for a major in Spanish. Uh, doesn't mean I learned a lot, but I technically could have <laughs> declared that as my major. While I was in school, one of my uh, instructors named Walt Richter, called me into his office one day and asked me how the job search was going. I said, well, I said, I've sent my resume out to about 50 places. And he said, have you by chance contacted Purdue University? And I said, no. I didn't know why I would. I was looking for a job in radio. He had gotten his master's degree at Purdue, and while he was here, he worked at the radio station. And he said, Dave, he said, that is the kind of radio station you would like. And he knew that I was more interested in non-commercial radio than most of the people I was going to school with. And it, and it, it strikes some people as funny. You know, commercial radio is where all the money is, or television. But, and I'm a strong free enterprise capitalist. I believe in advertising. I believe in commercial broadcasting. I think it's an important, an important part of our economy. But I didn't want to make my living in it. I wanted to work in non-commercial radio. And so he mentioned the station, and he said, from time to time I hear about job openings they have. He said, I don't, I don't know of any, but you, might, but you might write to him. He said, John DeCamp is the manager down there, great guy. In fact, you've probably heard him on the Indianapolis 500 Motor Speedway Network. And I had never listened to the race, and I, so I hadn't heard him. But I listened a week or so later and heard him. And so I wrote, and John wrote back right away and said, what great timing of my letter. At the time he received my letter, he had an employee who was off for a job interview. But fortunately, they decided to not take the job, so he didn't have any openings. But he would keep my name in file in case something opened up. You know, that sounds a little like the check is in the mail story. But a while back, I got a letter from John DeCamp that that person who had been looking for a job, in fact, was going to leave. Uh, tragically, it turns out his mother and father were killed in an automobile accident, and he and his wife were going to go back up to Milwaukee and raise his siblings. So he took off, and I came down, and I was, my recollection, I was, I was one of 50 or 52 people that interviewed for the job, and I got it. What year now was this? In this was in 1967. Okay. Now, as it turns out... Were you, were you excuse me, in Elliott? Is that where we were stationed? Yes. Okay. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the, he was leaving, but he wasn't going to be leaving until September. But they had a graduate assistant position that was opening up at that same time. So I came in in June of 67 as a graduate assistant. It was a half-time uh, appointment, but it got my foot in the door. 
And then September 1 of 67, when that other fellow left, I was full time. And uh, my wife and I got an apartment in West Lafayette. Oh, you were married by that time? I was married by that time. And uh, it turns out my father-in-law is a Purdue graduate. And, uh, but when I came down here and interviewed for the job and was offered the job, I didn't even realize that Purdue was a state university. The name doesn't sound like University of Illinois or Indiana University, uh, but I learned indeed that it was a state institution. And uh, so I became a full-time employee uh, September 1 of 1967. But then January 1st, I moved to a different position. Somebody one notch up the uh, ladder had taken a position in New York, so I got moved up to his position. And I was there for quite some time and started pursuing a master's degree. And I ended up getting my uh, Master of Science in Management from the Cranert School in 1967. The reason I pursued the master's degree in part was to make myself a better candidate for a radio management position someday. Uh, as an aside, I initially thought that I might get a master's in radio and television, and I in fact was accepted to the program here in Purdue, but then they found out they could not let me pursue it because they did not have at their master's level sufficient pr uh, studies in broadcasting that would go beyond what I had received in my bachelor's degree. Um, that speaks more to the breadth and depth of the program at Southern Illinois University than, here. than, than to here. So I majored in management, got my master's degree in management, probably never enjoyed school more than I did then, in part because I was doing it entirely because I wanted to learn stuff. It was all, for, it was all because I wanted to learn more. And I was not an exceptional student, but I, uh, I really, really liked that. I, when I pursued the bachelor's degree, I felt like, by George, I better have a degree if I'm going to get a job. And uh, I'm going to stick it out, finish. Yeah, and, but when I started the master's degree, that's just because I wanted the master's degree. And so I, I really loved it. And, of course, the program in the Cranert School is one of the, as far as numbers of hours, one of the largest master's programs that the university offers. As a full-time employee, it took me four years to get that degree. And uh, with an exception of one summer, I was maybe taking classes every single semester for the four years. But I got that. In the meantime, my wife had gotten her master's uh, uh, in art education and uh, got a teaching here job. Yes, yeah, she got it here at Purdue. She got a teaching job in the West Lafayette School. She taught art at the elementary level in the West Lafayette Schools for a number of years until we started having babies. And she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom when the kids were young. So uh, she was. Uh, we ended up having three girls over a period of about six years. And, and I, I, I say this often, people that know me know that I have a reasonably well-inflated self-image. I Frankly, I think I'm a nice guy. To the extent that that may be true, it is much more so since I became a father. One of the absolute most wonderful things that ever happened to me. And I consider myself fortunate in how much joy uh, my wife and my daughters have brought to me. I, I often consider myself to be the most richly blessed man in the world. Where did you meet your wife? Was this the girl that you dated? I met her at the radio station at Wheaton so, College. Okay. And, uh, and we married in, uh, in December of... Uh, of 1965, so I've been married 43 plus years, and uh, but I, I, you know, I I love her more dearly every day. My girls are just marvelous. Two of them are nearby. My oldest daughter, 30 years old, lives in Paris, France. I don't see her real often. How she, does she happen to end up? Is she married to a Frenchman? Or no, uh, in fact, she's single. But she uh, she got a bachelor's in German and a bachelor's in French from Purdue from Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. Uh, like a lot of kids, she wanted to go to school a ways away from mom and dad. But uh, they had a very fine language program. Uh, the school sometimes called the Ivy League of the South. They're really academically quite demanding. And she was an excellent student. She did her junior year of college abroad, one semester in Paris, one semester in Munster, Germany, and loved Paris. After she graduated, she worked for a year and then went to graduate school at Middlebury in uh, New Hampshire. They've always had a good yeah. language program. Uh, one, one of the finest in the nation. Right. And uh, she did most of her master's program at the Sorbonne and has only been back in the States briefly since then. 
She hasn't, as of the time we're having this conversation, she hasn't been in the States for almost two and a half years. Mm -hmm. But my wife did go and spend half of April with her this past spring, and so she enjoyed that. And we're already talking about maybe making a trip what in What does she uh, do over there? She teach? <laughs> She's a restaurant manager. <laughs> but she is, being multilingual helps her. Um, in high school, she took four languages, one here at Purdue and three in high school, and, and okay. it was excellent at all, so it comes quite naturally to her. My, my second daughter uh, started out at Ball State University and then transferred Purdue to Purdue, where she got a degree in math education. She teaches math at uh, Benton Central uh, uh, Middle School. And my youngest daughter is a student at Purdue and also works uh, about three part-time jobs, one of them at the radio station at Purdue, and uh, is uh, probably going to be finishing up school within about a year. And uh, she is still living at home with us for a little while longer. My middle daughter built a house just about a mile from us, so we see her occasionally and, and so on. Uh, my wife retired from teaching about a year and a half before I retired, and uh, so now we're able to do more things together, and we, uh, we're enjoying it a lot. Let's talk first. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the station, how it mm -hmm. got started, and changes that it made, and then we'll talk about you. And well, for a while, I felt that I was sort of the historian of the station. I was fascinated and looked into it and read as much as I could about it. Did and you ever write a history? Had you ever history been uh, it, history, some histories have been written that do a pretty good job. I didn't do it, uh -huh. but I've read everything I could Something about has it. Been. And the. Uh, I think probably the history of the station has been best documented in other writings, like the history of uh, engineering it covers it. But as an amateur radio operator, I was interested in, in fact, I was the faculty sponsor and the, uh, and the licensee of the Purdue Amateur Radio Club for a number of years, and the broadcast operation kind of grew out of the wireless experimentation that the radio amateurs were doing. The amateur radio operator started on Purdue's campus, amateur radio operations, sometime maybe, maybe before 1910, uh, certainly in the 1910s. In 1922, the Federal Radio Commission, the precursor of the Federal Communication Commission, the Federal Radio Commission granted a license to Purdue to operate the broadcast station, WBAA. And the early days of the operation, the station was on the air two nights a week, Monday nights and Friday nights for about two hours each. That's about all they had in the way of programs to put on. And, and probably staffing too. And they were, yeah, and, they were, and they were, the programs were live at that. And the, the rest of the time, the amateur radio operators would use the equipment for experimental transmissions and so on and so forth. Well, a problem arose when uh, the people getting ready to do the Monday night radio program came in and found that the part of the transmitter that allowed them to transmit with voice had been disassembled and set aside because the amateur operators over the weekend were using Morse code. So they had to quickly rebuild the transmitter so that they could get on the air Monday evening and somewhere they decided, you know, this isn't a very good way to run a railroad or a radio station. So they separated the two and the radio began to grow. It almost didn't grow at the beginning because the radio grew out of the uh, electrical school where the... Double E. Uh, well, it was actually before Double E. Okay. Uh, and, uh, the, but it grew out of that. And shortly after the professors proved that they could generate wireless communication, they didn't feel that they needed to continue to do it in order to teach it, which is true. But one of the professors said a radio station could be a real asset to the community and the surrounding area. And so he saw to it that the radio station continued to operate. He didn't have any budget for it. He had a squirrel a little bit way here and away here and there, and that's what got the station going. But he recognized that there was a whole community out there that uh, could benefit from maybe agricultural information from the Purdue School of Agriculture, weather information. Uh, there might be people out there who would be interested in knowing other things going on on campus. And early on, somebody decided, you know, Purdue likes to beat up on Indiana University in football. We ought to use the radio to tell people about that. And the first radio account of a Purdue versus Indiana University football game was in October 
of 1922. The radio station went on the air in April of 1922, first radio station in the state of Indiana. And in October... There was no other radio station in the state then? Not in April. By the, by, by the middle of 1923, there were a couple of dozen, because radio, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, really blossomed quickly. But uh, WBAA was the first in the state of Indiana. And there was no such thing as play-by-play -play sports back then. I don't think anybody thought of it. But what they did is they ran some wires, literally spooled wires along the curbside over to where the football game was being played. It must played. have been played on campus. It was played on campus. And I, at the end of each quarter, or periodically, someone would get on a microphone and just give a little summary back to the station of what was happening. That was before play-by-play -play of sports was, was even conceived. The radio station uh, gradually grew and in, and, and it changed frequency a few times. I believe it was after 1934, after the Communications Act of 1934, which created the FCC, is when WBAA was moved to the frequency of 920 kilohertz, where it is to this day. And then uh, uh, you could say, and the rest is history, but in fact that history included uh, some uh, fairly well-known people getting their broadcasting starts at WBAA, Derward Kirby, uh, who some people remember, people of my generation may remember from having been on the Gary Moore show and, and so on and so forth. Chris Schenkel got his radio start at Purdue University and never forgot it and uh, was always very gracious when he would be back on campus, come down and visit the station, talk to students and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And one thing about, the, uh, about WBAA that was different from where I went to school is when I was a student at Southern Illinois University, their FM radio station was staffed entirely by students, except for the chief engineer. And the students, we did the programs, we covered the news, we did it all. Here at Purdue, there was a full-time staff of professional broadcasters that did most of it with some student participation. When I was hired, one of the reasons I was given the job over some of the other candidates is that I had had experience in a, in a station that utilized students more heavily. And at that time, they wanted students to be more involved in the on-air operation of WBAA. So one of my missions was to attract more students and get them involved. And, uh, and so that was something that we did for some time. It was not always easy to get them. When I was getting my degree in radio and television, I had to work at the radio station. I got class credit for working at the station. I didn't get paid for it. If I was getting class credit, I wasn't getting paid for it. There were a few, very few paid student positions at the radio station, but primarily students were on the air, doing news, doing whatnot, and getting some class uh, practicum credit for it. So when I came here, I had a situation where a person could get a degree in radio and television at Purdue and never had to set foot in the radio station. They were not required to. Some professors did want them to get experience and knowing that we would audition students and, and give them some training in announcing, uh, some of the professors required their students to take our announcer tryout. They didn't require them to, to be in our training class because not all the students made it. We picked the, what, where we saw the most potential. So the situation was a little bit different than the way I'd grown up, but we got a, quite a number of students involved. Interestingly, it also meant that students who had no particular interest in making broadcasting a career may have also had an interest in broadcasting and participated in the radio station like they might a student activity. And as I think back to 40 plus years at the radio station, some of the most outstanding students I worked with, one was a young lady who got her BS in chemistry after she graduated from Purdue, she worked in broadcasting. Her, her last I heard, she was married and had a family, but was still was working in television out in, in the, on the West Coast. Another was a double E major, who worked at WBAA while a student went off and took an engineering job. When he came back to Purdue to get his master's at the Granite School, he again worked part time at the radio station, and now is back in, in engineering. And another one that came to mind was a young fellow who. After I became the station manager of WBIA, I tried to hire him when he graduated because he was absolutely phenomenal on the air. But he was an ag econ major, 
and he had gotten a job with a bank back home elsewhere in Indiana where he was going to be working primarily doing farm loans and could also help his father run the family farm. I had the, I've had the delightful opportunity to visit with him once or twice since then, one of those times when he was back on campus watching his son in the Purdue Glee Club during the Christmas show, <laughs> so the, the family ties are always fun to follow. But uh, I've seen a lot of changes over the years. I saw us go from when I was hired, uh, a station that was on the air only Monday through Saturday. Daytime? Uh, from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And gradually we expanded that, and now the station is on the air 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We've added the FM station. It's also, ask about that. And you got the N, uh, NPR. And, and uh, when NPR was created, we were one of the first affiliates of NPR. <laughs> So the station has grown a lot. I remember when compact discs were first created. I'm quite certain that WBAA was the first radio station in the community to broadcast any music from a compact disc. And, uh, and I can remember when the first computer of some kind came into the radio station. And uh, so I've seen, you know, I've seen some changes in technology not the likes of which my father observed, my father who can remember the first crystal set that anybody in his whole community had, and then before he died, you know, saw a man on the moon and talked on cell phones, but uh, so there have been a lot of technological changes there, but I've seen quite a few of them mm-hmm. and, uh, and have enjoyed, uh, enjoyed watching What's those changes. What's the liaison with the university? And, we're, and talk about fundraising. What okay. The station is and always has been owned and operated by and licensed to the university. As a radio station staff member, I was a Purdue employee. I had the, uh, the same you know, staff benefits as any one of a number of other Purdue employees. When I started, the university provided all of the funding for the radio station. After the, when, you first came? when I first came in 1967. When the Corporation for Public Broadcasting was created and they funded the creation of National Public Radio and PBS, the Public Broadcasting System for Television, grants went to certain public stations that qualified and WBA qualified, so we got a, we got a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and we have every year since then. As that grant grew in size, uh, some of that grant money helped to pay for one staff person It helped to pay some of our programming costs and uh, some of our other expenses. But the costs grew fast, of operating the station grew faster than the grant increased. The university continued to uh, provide some additional funding. But we were not soliciting financial support from listeners. It was becoming increasingly common throughout the country for public radio stations to solicit support from listeners. The position of Purdue at the time was, uh, uh, I was general manager during one of the discussions, was that we would be, it would not be wise to seek permission of the university to solicit funds if we didn't have some assurance that the university would not then cut our funding by a like amount. And this in fact happened at a number of stations. If, for example, the university gave us a budget of $150,000 a year and we went out and worked real hard and raised $20,000 from our listeners and the university decided to cut our budget back to $130,000, we would not be ahead at all. So that was, that was one reason why we didn't get into it right away. The way some people looked at it is the people of Indiana are already supporting the radio station through their tax dollars, even if they never listen. On the other hand, some of them were saying, well, Yes, everybody's helping to support it, but those people who listen should be invited to give more, which was also a very good argument. Well, the time came when we were given the green light to solicit funds from listeners and from corporate supporters uh, within the community, and uh, we've done that with uh, growing success. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the staff size has grown somewhat. We did, in fact, add the FM station some years ago. Uh, But in fact, the overall size of the staff would surprise some people. When I was hired in June of 1967, 
there were 18 staff members at the radio station. Full-time staff. Two of them were not quite full-time. Two of them, I think, were 75% appointments. But for the most part, they were. But everyone else full-time. And the station was on the air from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., six days a week. Now, WBAA operates two radio stations, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with a staff of about 14. Everybody wears lots of different hats, and to some degree, things are easier because of the presence of National Public Radio and other networks. We can get some programming intact via satellite so that our staff members are not having to be producing and creating every single program sure. that's on the air. What were some of your duties? How did it change over time? I, uh, I started, as I mentioned, I started as a graduate assistant. My first full-time position after that was as... Uh, chief announcer and then three months later I became uh, production coordinator and uh, I held that position for quite some time until John DeCamp who had been manager of the station for a long time decided to take a job in publicity at the athletic department he did that I became the acting manager then uh, and after about 10 months, uh, it was decided to name me as the, uh, as the station manager. I held that position for approximately 15 years. And I stepped down from that position to the position of uh, uh, production uh, manager, production coordinator, uh, which I held for some time. And then uh, it must have been roughly 15 years ago, I became program director and then uh, some years after that, became, I was program director of the AM station, and then I was program director of both the AM and the FM station. When Dan Skinner, who had been our general manager for about 14 years, left, I was the interim manager and was on the search committee to find the current station manager as of this uh, conversation, uh, Tim Singleton, and then I went back to being program director, a uh, position from which I retired at the end of December. 19, or I'd like you to talk a little bit about Johnny DeCamp and also uh, uh, Jim Miles. Jim Miles. Another name, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going I'm to start with Jim because he was here before John was. Sure. Uh, Jim Miles was the station manager of WBAA when John DeCamp came to Purdue as a student. And John started working at the radio station right away, did play-by-play -play of high school sports and was very, very interested in sports. Got his degree in, in uh, uh, electrical engineering and left for a short period of time and then came back to WBAA as a full-time employee. Uh, Jim Miles, and I believe it was, th it was through the State Department, I think, I think it was through the U.S. Office of Information, USIA or USAI or something like that, uh, took a position to help develop non-commercial broadcasting in American Samoa. It was about a one-year assignment that he did and, uh, and in fact instructional television was very well developed in American Samoa after that. Uh, he and others really got a, a, a great way of helping to educate the people of the islands. And um, during that time, John DeCamp was acting as station manager and did a, was doing a very good job. And when Jim Miles came back, rather than putting him back at the radio station, they put him over with the television uh, unit. And uh, um, and he was there in uh, uh, the, the, the television unit. I forget what all the names were, but it reported to Jim until his retirement. John DeCamp uh, hired me, as I mentioned, in 1967. Uh, John was uh, a marvelous gentleman, still well-remembered by thousands of people in the community, thought by many to be the quintessential voice of Purdue, and uh, known, of course, for play-by-play -play of Purdue sports through some very exciting times, some great ball games. Uh, I can remember being at ball games with him at uh, bowl games that we won when he was uh, on the announcing crew. Uh, but when the bleachers collapsed in the old field house years ago, John was broadcasting a basketball game live, and the bleachers were, that he was on did not collapse. But his on-air account of what was going on helped to marshal buses and taxi cabs and so on that came over to help serve as ambulances because so many people were hurt. It was in 1947. And uh, a little before my time. But, uh, but that was just one of those things that John did, uh, really took in his stride. Something that I, as a broadcaster, was very aware of 
And I appreciated hearing non-broadcasters, but sports fans saying, is that hardly anybody that did play-by-play -play of a ball game did as good a job as John DeCamp of painting in your mind what was happening on the floor. There was no question in your mind that John DeCamp wanted Purdue to win, but he would do the best he could to give an accurate portrayal of what was happening. And that meant if he thought that the officials weren't doing well, he was not afraid to say so. If he thought that uh, Purdue could have done this or that better, he was not afraid to say so. But he was never the type to badmouth a student, a player, an athlete. Uh, he, uh, he, he tried at all times to be fair, but he didn't try to hide his bias. And Purdue fans loved it because they bled black and gold, as did he, and they wanted Purdue to win. And if Purdue won, they were euphoric with him, and if they lost, they were sad with him. But I know from having watched basketball games on television while listening to John DeCamp describe the game that what he was telling me was exactly what was happening. And I appreciated that. And that has, that has not always been the case when I have watched a ball game and maybe had a radio on in the arena or been at home watching on television and listening. So John had a gift that was uh, very, very special. Yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah. That's true. Uh, what was the, uh, any liaison with the local radio station? <coughs> and also, I'd like to talk about guests. Now, you had, uh, you had Dr. Jeske on. Dr. Yeah. Jeske was on regularly. I, I want to I go back to something uh, oh. back in the history of the station. Yeah. There were a couple of times in the history of the station when the question was raised, was it necessary or appropriate for the university to continue to operate the station? At times when budgets were tight, sometimes people said, you know, we don't need this radio station. Let's get rid of it. It is my understanding, although I was not there, that someone at a board of trustees meeting once brought up the suggestion that to save money, they get rid of the radio station. And it is my understanding that the then chairman of the board of trustees, and I don't know who it was, said, my mother listens every day. There's no way in the world we're going to get rid of that station while I'm on the board of trustees. And that ended the discussion. I, I don't know to the extent to which there may be truth in that. But I do know that from time to time, there were people within the administration who said, you know, this station has served its purpose. Um, we do not need that financial liability because it was not contributing significantly to the academic program of the university. It certainly was not bringing any money to the university. I was of the opinion, and I made this case to the Board of Trustees on at least one occasion, that... WBAA was the closest connection that some taxpaying Hoosiers had to the university. There are people within the radio station's listening area that have never set foot on campus but helped to support the radio station with their tax dollars, helped to support the university. And the radio station can be a good source of information about the university that they are helping to support. And that through the radio station, those people may learn about art exhibits on campus that may appeal to them, about convocations events, about speakers coming to campus, about ball games coming up. Believe it or not, not everybody in the state cares about athletics. Some people very much so, and they're going to seek out the university for that. But uh, there are other things going on at the university that may be of interest to a person and they don't know about it. And the radio station, I felt, could play a role in that. Dr. Jiski came on board, what, 11, 12 years 2001. ago, 2001 or whatever it was, and immediately named a new position on campus, the Vice President for Advancement, a position taken by Dr. Murray Blackwelder. And Dr. Jiski chose to put several areas directly under advancement, development, university news service, univers university relations, and the radio station. Well, this brought the radio station administratively up several levels from where it had been and <coughs> gave us, um, well, some people were concerned at the time, oh, my goodness, you're going to be side by side with the university news service. We had a staff member at the time that was concerned that all of a sudden we would only be able to say on the air what the university would allow us to say, that, we, that if, if there was a lawsuit against the university, we couldn't mention it. If there was a problem, we couldn't mention it. But in fact, Murray Blackwelder told our, the, the station's then general manager, Dan Skinner, he said, I know how to raise funds. 
I don't know how to run a radio station. I want you to make WBAA the best radio station you can make it. That's, that's how it will best serve Purdue. So that was a mission that we all were able to really embrace. Where did you report? Whom did you report to? Uh, when I was general manager, I reported to then uh, Donald Brown, and then uh, uh, and then I, uh, after some rearrangement, I then reported to Dick Forsyth, and uh, and the station was reporting to Dick Forsyth at such time as Dr. Jiski came on board and, and shuffled a number of things. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, when Dr. Beering was the general manager, we had got, I, I was, was the president, we had gotten him on the radio on a couple of occasions and talked to him about what was going on, whether it was legislation that was uh, maybe uh, of interest to the university, growth, a variety of things. And uh, we wanted to do it on a regular basis, but we simply were not granted access to him on a regular basis. That partially was because of the hierarchy through whom we had to go. One person had to ask this person who had to get the okay here, who had to get the okay a little further up the line, and maybe the request would get to the president's office. Maybe somewhere along the line, a person says, you know, I have a chance to talk to the president next week. I got this stuff that's more important than asking if he'll be on the radio. I don't, that's my speculation as to how it may have worked. But when Dan Skinner, the general manager of the station, was first introduced to Dr. Jiski, he uh, was introduced as the station manager, and Dr. Jiski said, "Oh, at Iowa, I was on their public radio station uh, regularly." And and uh, Dan said, "We would like to have you on our station regularly as well." And Dr. Jiski turned to one of his assistants and said, "Let's make sure that happens." And so, with only a couple of exceptions, Dr. Jiski was on the station once a month for until until he retired, and that gave. Uh, that provided a variety of opportunities. It did provide an opportunity for people to call in if they had I questions. Say he had a call in as well. And, uh, and uh, of course, Dr. Jiski came in with some specific things on his mind that he wanted to share with people. It might be uh, uh, talking about some new, uh, uh, some new program that was going to start uh, based on some big government grants or, or, or contributions. It may talk about growth. It may talk about you know, rankings of the university. A variety of things were always on the agenda. But every program, the phone lines were open, and people could ask about those things or something else entirely if they wished. And uh, so that was, that was a communication that we really enjoyed. In addition to that, we also regularly interviewed a variety of other people from Purdue. We had a daily program called AM 920 Magazine. It started out as a two-hour morning program. We changed it later to a, an afternoon program and cut it back to one hour. But we would regularly talk to people from the School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, we would talk to people from political science. We would talk to uh, Dr. Tom Turpin from entomology. Just uh, quite a variety uh, of areas. The School of Nursing, the School of Pharmacy, and so on. And the way I looked at it, there are, you know, this is a large enough institution. There are enough things going on, enough fascinating people that we could talk to somebody every day and only scratch the surface. And, uh, but we, we sometimes ran into a problem. Sometimes it was hard to find the person who was willing to talk, could take the time to, and capable of expressing themselves orally with more than yes or no answers. And uh, so sometimes we... It takes a little program. It takes a, it takes a little effort. Uh, Dan Skinner and I did that program together for quite a long time. He was the primary host and I was the backup host. As his duties as manager uh, started taking more and more of his time, I started hosting the program a little more often. But we would augment the local guests with interviews with a variety of authors and newsmakers that we might run across. I was thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to Mary Higgins Clark on a couple of occasions, one of my favorite authors, David Baldacci. I've talked to uh, on a couple of occasions. I enjoy his books a lot. And uh, on a, a number of other people, uh, well-known uh, authors, uh, some in uh, fiction, some in, in uh, the world of nonfiction. But uh, of course, there are always publishers and publicists that want their authors to be heard, so people will go and buy their books. And, and uh, so it was easy to line up such. And we could sometimes do an interview in the morning, maybe two or three interviews in the morning, and then have them uh, Recorded so that if a if a live guest all of a sudden couldn't make it, we could still have something on the air. You always had to have a backup plan. Had a, had a backup plan. When Dan left, uh, our new general manager was uh, 
was not interested in uh, taking part of his time doing that kind of programming, so the program fell entirely on my shoulders. And with the other duties that I had, uh, just doing that program was almost a half-time job, even though it was only one hour a day, the preparation time and so on. And uh, so it got to be uh, just, just more than I could handle. And it was getting harder and harder to get local people on a regular basis. So we decided to uh, further strengthen our news operation. And you know, rather than talk to somebody from the Department of Political Science once a month because we decided to do it once a month, every time there was something worthy of talking to them about, we would. If that meant three times in one month and not for the next six weeks, so be it. It's and the currency. Exactly. So we started, we started focusing more on that. And I think uh, there's always room for more of that, but, uh, but really, in this day and age, the local in the media is really important. As more and more commercial radio and television uh, and more cable television takes us outside of our local community, I think it's even more important that those of us who are here do keep in touch with the local community. What about membership? Uh for the researchers told about that? After we were given the green light to solicit financial support directly from our listeners, we started doing that uh, in the form of on-air fundraising. Uh, a couple of times a year we would have an on- on-air fund drive. We gradually refined our technique. We added to that, in some cases, some direct mail solicitation. And we are now soliciting support from listeners uh, really throughout the year. The feeling of the station is that everything they have on the air is worthy of support, and a person may not happen to be listening when they're having an on-air fun drive. So throughout the year, they're reminded that they can give at any time uh, to the radio station, and some people, you know, just out of the blue, they'll they'll make a contribution. But the station is still having a couple of times a year when they concentrate uh, their uh, their search for funds, and are continuing to refine the way they do that how much time they spend on the air asking for support. But it's really become important. The last fund drive in which I was directly involved as a staff member had as a goal to raise, I think the goal was to raise $130,000. And they were going to intensely solicit funds until such and such a date and then stop. Well, by that date, they hadn't hit the $130,000 mark. But with lower key reminders after that 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 the need was still there, uh, funds continued to come in. In some cases, people all week long, they meant to call, and they didn't get around to it, and finally they got around to it. And so that has resulted in something over $130,000 having been raised. Uh, money that's used, I, I, I think all or very, very nearly every penny of it, directly to support programming. And, uh, and I feel good about that because I remember years ago a friend in another state where the budget situation in the state, and I think my personal opinion is that that state's finances were not handled as well as Indiana's generally have been. There were huge cuts to the state universities, huge cuts to their broadcasting operations, and this fellow was managing a public radio station where he had to he had to let two people go who were producing programs for the radio station and hire two people to raise money. And he said he said it it. It, he said it felt dirty to get rid of people that were creating the programs and then, and then hire people to ask for money for the programs that are no longer being created, is the way you put it. He said it was one of the hardest things he ever did. Oh, right. But uh, uh, Do you but have somebody that handles the development for you? There is a full-time staff member who handles development and uh, is doing, you know, we've had a variety of people in that position o- over time. Sure. Um, and uh, they're always learning new techniques. There's good support in the university. One of the nice things about being under the uh, uh, vice president for advancements office, development is right there. So there are development resources that uh, that can help. There are two staff members whose responsibility is to contact businesses and organizations in the community for their support, which is acknowledged on the air in the form of underwriting announcements. Uh, so that, that part of the operation and the on-air solicitation and support uh, appears to be quite healthy. The, um, what the, is there any liaison with the local radio station? Oh, yeah. uh, not a direct and formal, 
but uh, you know each other, but, it's the community. Yeah. But yeah, and there's been there's been some great informal cooperation. Sure. Uh, the uh, uh, back when WASK was doing more local news, which they're hardly doing any of anymore. But back when they were, sometimes one of our news people would be at this event, and one of their news people would be at that event, and they would they would sure. uh, trade tape afterwards, so that. Uh, so that each station could get the benefit of information going on at both locations. That kind of thing was handled informally amongst the members of the new, various news staffs as professional courtesies. We have a great relationship with Channel 18, um, and uh, and this uh, this has taken the form of uh, Jeff Smith from Channel 18 is regularly uh, over at the WBA studios uh, with a weekly kind of a round of what's been going on in the previous week in the news. And Max Showalter from the Journal and Courier joins that as well. So the WBAA news staff and those two people from other media in the community can talk about uh, whether it's, you know, this funding program that's, you know, being hurt by state sure. funds going down or whatever. They can talk about what's going on in, in the local news. And they, that's good to get. Yeah, exactly, people. exactly. A little bit more texture and depth uh, and breadth to it. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how the campus has changed since you've been here. Well, uh, 60s and 70s and beyond, right? Yeah. And the village. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. The Probably the biggest change that I notice having been here all this time is the same change that a person would notice if they just came back after 40 years. It's and there bigger. are some that have done that. Yes, it's bigger. There are a lot more buildings. There are a lot more students. When I came to Purdue in June of 1967, my recollection is there were around 15,100 students. I'd have to look that up. That my mem resonates my memory is often horrible, but I believe that's about right. Sure. And uh, there are a whole lot more than that now. Uh, I have... I believe that I have seen a higher regard for the university throughout the community, throughout the state, and throughout the nation than I did in the mid-60s. And this place was no slouch then. Uh, I can remember my father, who I indicated worked for the Commonwealth Edison Company in Chicago. I can remember him telling me that I should be really proud of Purdue University. I said, why is that? He said, he said the top young employees that we are hiring are engineers from Purdue with business degrees, whether they be from Cranert or from Harvard or Case Western Reserve, and he mentioned a couple of the other big top masters in business programs, but uh, he said the Purdue engineers were as sharp as any they got, whether they came from Illinois or MIT or Michigan, and, and he had the opportunity to, to, to meet a number of them as young people, and, uh, and he knew that when recruiters were out looking for engineers, Purdue was high on their list. And you think, you know, they're right there in Chicago. They've got Notre Dame close by. They've got the you know, University of Chicago. They've got the University of Illinois. They're close to Madison, Wisconsin. But Purdue, still only a few hours away, was high on the list. And, and he thought I should be proud of that. Well, I was, even though I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> but uh, the, the changes I've noticed, some of the changes I've noticed are just changes because of the changes in the times. Things that even if the university had not grown larger in enrollment and in, in buildings, other changes. Um, the forces. Yeah, yeah. In some cases, uh, uh, issues of safety and security, uh, issues of uh, uh, privacy, uh, issues of students' rights. Some of these things have sadly had to uh, change. Some of these things fortunately have had to change. But some of those kinds of changes have hit the little tiny schools of 2,000 just as they've hit the schools of, with tens Diversity of thousands. Diversity is another one. Diversity. Right. And uh, the <clears> – <throat> but I can remember when I came here, one of the – an old tradition of Purdue was going away. That was the senior courts. And when I was a youngster, we had a neighbor boy – this was up in Wheaton, Illinois – who went to Purdue, the mechanical engineering major. And I can remember seeing him wear his senior cords, and I didn't know what in the world this is about. You know, these, these kind of pale yellow or tan corduroy pants with eyeballs painted on his rear end, I just didn't quite understand. Of course, I was only 10 or 11 or so at the time. But, it but does re you don't remember that. But, but I still remember it, and right. I can remember seeing senior cords after I got here. But that didn't last very long. They, they kind of went by the wayside. 
Uh, if we tried to bring them back one time, but I, didn't. That, that, I, I, have, I vaguely 80s, recall that. It, just didn't. it didn't go. I don't think Breakfast Club was around when I first started, but maybe it was, and I just didn't run in those circles. I, uh, uh, I don't quite understand it, but then I don't drink. And uh, uh, I... Uh, the village, well, the village has changed a lot. The village has changed a lot. Sure. And, uh, uh, and for the most part, probably for the good. Right. Uh, I can remember when student apartments were almost unheard of. Well, now there are a bazillion student apartments. I think it's interesting that with the rapid growth of student apartments, the university housing situation at Purdue is still bigger and better than about anything in the country. That's right. And yeah. with the new one, and they yeah. seem to get filled up. And, yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about your retirement activities. What are your plans? Well, I have to put this in the context of, I mentioned earlier how fortunate I feel in my, in my very happy marriage with my marvelous kids, but I was also fortunate in another way. I love my job. I work with some great people, and but my mind and body were very ready for retirement, and so I gleefully and joyfully moved from as I as I put it, I think at my retirement reception, I'm gone from being a WBA staff member to uh, to joining the ranks of some of the best people in the world, WBA listeners and supporters. I still listen to the station. Uh, support the station, and I still love the station, and I love the university. But my wife and I are still young enough to want to do a lot of things. I mentioned very briefly we're beginning to talk about a trip to see our daughter in Paris. Uh, this summer, uh, summer of 2009, we're taking about a five-week trip out west. Some of that f for sheer sightseeing, some to visit family, some to visit friends. Uh, my wife is, uh, is an artist and a very fine fabric artist. And she's going to be attending a, a fabric art quilting workshop in Colorado for about a week. While she's doing that, I intend to do a little hiking in the mountains and uh, taking some pictures with a very nice camera that the WBA staff gave me as a retirement gift and also talking on my amateur radio, which is in my pickup truck that we'll be traveling in. You're, set. And, you're, uh, you're set to move ahead. Yeah, yeah we're, we're looking forward to, to some of that. And uh, we've got a few small trips uh, also uh, coming up. Uh, we like to travel, and we uh, and there are certain places we like to go again and again. We have probably vacationed in the state of Michigan more than any other. One of our favorite places to go is a bed and breakfast near Traverse City, Michigan. Turns out the people that own it are originally from Fort Wayne. If a son is a Purdue graduate, I guess it's just magnetism or something like that. But uh, I love life. I really do. And my wife and I enjoy, very much enjoy doing things together. We don't have to do everything together. Uh, I can go out and have breakfast with some of my buddies, and, and she can go to her uh, uh, quilt guild meetings or whatever. But uh, an awful lot of what we do and look forward to doing, we'll be doing together and, uh, and with our daughters sometimes. Um, look ahead at WBA in the 21st century. A couple comments on that. Well, interestingly, I talked earlier about the fact that there have been technological changes that have affected radio. They're still coming at, at a high rate of speed. In late 2008, WBAA began broadcasting on their AM with uh, HD radio technology that, that allowed uh, uh, stereo broadcasting on AM and a higher quality broadcasting on AM than, than most people ever re realized was possible. Uh, HD radio is coming to the FM bands as well. That will open up new opportunities opportunities for additional program streams. Whereas we now have two radio stations on the air, the opportunities are opening up for those two radio stations to be broadcasting more than one thing at, one, at the same time. And a person can have the radio tuned to WBAA, flick a switch and hear a different WBAA program, and, and so on. So there, there are going to be opportunities for further service to the community and the listeners, but also greater challenges. How do they fund that? How do they staff the uh, the, the, the facilities to provide the programming. But those are, you know, uh, you know, what's life without challenges? And so those are some of the challenges that uh, the radio station has ahead of it that uh, I think the station and its staff, and I know I as a listener, see not just as challenges but as op opportunities. Good point. Uh, your favorite tradition? 
you know, I've, I've been thinking about that. I don't know that I have a favorite Purdue you have tradition. A Purdue tradition that sticks in your head. Um, like uh, beating Indiana in basketball has always been good, even though we haven't done it as much as I would like. I remember saying to Gene Cady once, you know, losing's a whole lot better when you don't. And uh, that was after a Purdue win. Uh, but, uh, and I'm not a big sports nut, but I, but I love Purdue sports. And I watch some Cubs games from time to time and Chicago Bears and the Indianapolis Colts. But uh, favorite traditions, I, I don't really know. I think probably because I don't feel like I have been a big part of a lot of the traditions. And had I done my undergraduate days at Purdue, uh, that might be different. I might have gotten more wrapped up in, the, in the Grand Prix, for example. But as a staff member, I just was never really part of that. Right. Your outstanding event? There are, have been a number of them. Uh, there have been both personal and professional outstanding experiences. Uh, you know, on a personal level, having fantastic parents, meeting and marrying the most wonderful gal in the world, and my marvelous daughters, though, those are you know, still stand out. Uh, I Probably on a little broader scale, having so many people professionally and otherwise in the community that I can really call friends. Because, uh, you know, I am a people person and the radio station has given me the opportunity to meet lots of interesting people, many of whom I'm delighted to, to still feel close to even though I'm not at the station anymore. On a professional level, I've had the opportunity to meet a couple of people that I thought were particularly fascinating. I mentioned briefly some of the interviews with big name authors, but one of the most fascinating people that I met through my job was a man named John Fetzer. John Fetzer, as a student in West Lafayette years ago, used to come over, as a high school student, used to come over to Purdue and kibitz with the engineers and uh, with the professors and students who were studying wireless transmission. He helped to construct the first transmitter that WBAA used to get on the air. He may have been the first person in the state of Indiana to successfully transmit voice. He went on to become quite the broadcaster. He made his entire career in broadcasting. At the end of World War II, President Eisenhower selected him to go over to Europe and help European broadcasting operations get back on their feet. He owned radio and television stations and then later cable stations in a variety of states. At one time, he was the sole owner of the Detroit Lions, uh, Detroit, uh, Detroit Tigers baseball team. I had an opportunity to visit him in his office uh, in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan on a couple of occasions before he passed away. He showed me one of the World Series trophies that, that uh, uh, the, the Detroit team had won. He went to Purdue for just a little while before his family moved to Michigan. He got his degree in Michigan. And I can remember him telling me that although he had numerous doctorate degrees, had he ever actually earned his bachelor's degree from Purdue, it would have been the most important to him because even then he still loved Purdue dearly. I made a pitch to the Board of Trustees for this man to receive an honorary doctorate because he truly was a pioneer in broadcast communications, starting right here at WBAA and then on through his entire career. Um, that suggestion was followed. I got to write the, uh, uh, the presentation that was read when he was given an honorary degree from Purdue. That was a huge thrill in my life. He's since passed away, but I still remember dearly the time that I spent with him and his reminiscences as a boy in this community growing up on this campus and so on. Very nice. Any closing comments and something that you'd like to share or some topics? That... Part of this has nothing to do with my career at Purdue or my time at, at the radio station, but it's part of who I am. I think it's, it is easy in these times for people to get concerned about a narrow focus of things, uh, whether it's just their job or just their kids' sports or something. But I think it's important, and quite rightly at a university, for people to remember 
um, what the Renaissance brought us, and that we are better people if we wrap ourselves up into and invest ourselves in a lot of different things. Read, go to the theater, uh, enjoy music, play music, um, keep our minds and bodies active, and uh, no better place to do that than at a university. And if you, uh, if you benefit from Purdue Convocations, not just by buying tickets, support it. If you enjoy what you hear on the radio, support it. If Purdue Athletics are a big part of your life, don't just buy tickets, support it in other ways. If you were a graduate of the School of Science or, or, or the uh, or, uh, humanities uh, area and it has uh, served you well in life or in a career, um, support it, not just with your mouth, but, uh, but in other ways as well. Very nicely said. I want to thank you very much, David. Very good interview. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank you.